It's in my capacity as chair of the Education Committee that I would like to welcome you here to Parliament Buildings and to today's seminar. The theme is social inclusion and educational attainment. Many studies of inclusion have concluded that there are identifiable features in schools with an inclusive ethos. These features include high expectations for all pupils and dynamic responses to the needs of individuals. For many, an inclusive school is considered to be one which provides broadly the same educational op opportunities for all pupils, making the necessary changes in teaching and environment to meet the individual needs of children. A culture of reflective practice where teachers and other staff display a willingness to change, innovate and to learn from each other has been identified as having a positive bearing on inclusion. The series of KESS seminars provides a valuable opportunity for people to share innovative practice and this afternoon um, there will be two presentations which will give you an opportunity to reflect upon and to discuss the concept of inclusive education. Firstly, Dr Foley and Dr Rees from the University of Ulster will share findings from the Language Made Fun programme. This is a play-based language intervention programme for primary school newcomer pupils from refugee families. The project is a joint innov innov innovation between um, Ulster Centre on multilingualism and Bernardo's Northern Ireland. Language Made Fun is specifically aimed at supporting the English language skills of newcomer pupils who may be vulnerable to exclusion and educational failure. This presentation will highlight key findings of the project. The second presentation this afternoon is from Professor Leach, <coughs> Professor Hughes and Dr Jordan of Queen's University Belfast. And they will focus on differences in educational achievement within and between areas of multiple deprivation in Northern Ireland. Professor, Professor Leach and her, her colleagues will be presenting the findings of the Iliad research study, a three-year study funded by the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. Her presentation outlines findings and recommendations that aim to both increase understanding and inform policy development and strategic planning regarding educational performance. I'd like to welcome all of our speakers and I hope that you have an enjoyable and a very informative afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Raffaella Folli and I'm a linguist at the uh, University of Ulster and I'm the head of School of Communication and I'm here to present the sort of the, the gist of this uh, program that we ran last year called Language Made Fun. So Language Made Fun, as we as was mentioned before, is a joint initiative between UCOM, which is the Ulster Centre on Multilingualism at Ulster and Bernardo's and I. It is a play-based language intervention programme for ESL children. Uh, it was uh, led by uh, some of our students, some of our second year students volunteers. Uh, it involved uh, uh, three Arabic-speaking children and in essence, in few words, you'll see that I uh, provide evidence that uh, such type of interventions can lead to uh, positive outcomes for vocabulary and grammar and indeed for uh, language confidence more generally. So for a second, first, what is UCOM? UCOM is, a, as I said, the center, uh, the Ulster Center on Multilingualism. It was established by the linguistic team at Ulster University in June 2012. And it's meant to be a service where we uh, uh, disseminate uh, the, the, the fruits of our research out to the wider society, so to parents who might be raising children with more than one language, to educators or language professionals that are working with the children uh, that have more than one language and what we do this by both uh, services that are delivered online to a Twitter ch uh, channel and uh, website but we also deliver many hands-on initiatives and indeed on our website uh, if you google for UCOM you'll find that there is a place where we list um, some of the initiatives we have been uh, involved in in the past few years. 
Our central aim is, uh, if you want twofold to be uh, uh, brief, uh, is to basically support and promote uh, multilingualism. And I'm using multilingualism, um, uh, you know, uh, many people talk about bilingualism, but we want to be more general about this because one of our projects, in fact, that relates to children that are learning three languages. By forging basically links with the greater community to address the subject of uh, acquisition of more than one language in Ireland and uh, UK and wider European community. Uh, but we also have a very important further aim, which is to forge a greater awareness of the indigenous languages of Northern Ireland and the new immigrant languages, so the, the territory reality uh, when we're talking about multiple languages. And by doing that, we, try, we, we think we are therefore promoting the benefits of multilingualism. Why did we want to uh, create a center of this kind? It's, well, there are many, many reasons. Uh, uh, first and foremost is because we think, uh, in line with much current research, that bilingualism or multilingualism is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is good. <laughs> it leads to a lot of uh, advantages, both cognitively and socially, and it's something we should cherish and we should, we should uh, find a way to uh, help uh, in many ways. We, we decided to, of course, create this center because we are linguists with a lot of knowledge about language and uh, the differences between languages. We are involved in research in multilingualism. Some of us are raising children who are more than one language and be studying this uh, thoroughly. So we have we, both the expertise and the investment, uh, both personal and professional, in this topic that led us to this. Bernardo's, it was a, 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 an encounter when we opened the center. Um, people from Bernardo's came and they heard what we had to say. They heard about the research that has been done um, in uh, our university as well as in other uh, parts of the world. And they thought that there was a clear possibility for um, getting together and, and uh, uh, try to do something um, when it comes to this on the territory. Of course, we all know what Bernardo's is, Dynamic and Dynamic Children Charity, that has an enormous amount of um, uh, services on the territory, working with thousands of children. There are some of the, of the numbers there and in your PowerPoint. I won't go through the details of this um, in the interest of time. And then we, uh, in Bernardo's, we got together in particular with one of their services, one of their projects, uh, uh, Kehar. I'm sorry for the pronunciation, uh, but uh, Irish is not one of my languages, <laughs> um, which provides a range of uh, family services to children from uh, family, from refugees' family in, in general, to BMER families in the greater Belfast area. And they do so um, to basically try to, uh, uh, under the themes of empowerment, poverty and education. So it was obviously uh, a good uh, marriage there. Um, so this is the project in a picture. Uh, these are three of our of the students who were involved, uh, three absolutely brilliant uh, students from second year. They were chosen, as we will explain later, based on very thorough uh, selection criteria. And these are the three kids. At the end of the project, we had a party with them and their family to sort of celebrate this um, uh, very good initiative. Uh, that definitely brought something to each one of us. So it's a, what is it? In few words, is as I said, it's a play-based language intervention. So it's not class uh, room teaching, it's a playing with words and with books and with other toys to um, work on, uh, on English. It was directed to newcomer pupils. So Bernardo's was in charge of selecting the pupils and there was a lot of discussion uh, about how to uh, select the children. Um, the aim was to encourage and support the children's uh, uh, native language as, as well as promoting the benefits of multilingualism. So we were helping them with English, but at the same time, we're providing both to the children and to their family a lot of support about the importance of uh, uh, keeping up their language. It was three children, age six, age six and seven, and basically, you know, in a nutshell, we found, you know, that uh, what we did in the span of a few weeks really led to a positive impact for both language and communication skills. The, uh, project uh, lasted 12 months in the sense that there was a lot of preparation and a lot of uh, evaluation at the end and in fact we're uh, still uh, we are just we just finished the report uh, and we're just finishing off the evaluation uh, part the writing up of the evaluation um, but basically it lasted it had five phases and the students were involved for 12 weeks um, and as we will see in a second the five phases were recruitment and training observation and assessment 
target selection, which was the selection of the specific areas of language that we were going to work on, intervention and evaluation, but you'll get a lot more uh, from Catherine in a second about this. We chose three Arabic-speaking uh, children, well, Bernardo's chose the children, and the, the only thing that we were saying is given it's a pilot that is fairly small, it would be ideal if we could choose uh, three kids from the same uh, first language background, because that would obviously help us in time to identify communal features um, in what might have been the transfer from uh, first language to second language. The weekly intervention sessions that were run by the students lasted one hour every week, and they were done in the, I think, for, uh, they were done all of them in the house of the, of the children. That was a preference of the family that were involved. The sessions were divided between vocabulary and grammar, and they were, as I said, uh, play-based activity. Uh, the students read the session, and the linguists in the university uh, met the students every week to discuss what they were doing, what they were finding, they they were taking uh, recording and logs of their um, uh, work. The aims uh, were to develop the community language competence of these children in order to support their social integration and ultimately access to education, uh, to re uh, recognize and reinforce the value of the importance of their own language whilst nurturing also the competence in English. And we were doing this by basically trying to access, uh, uh, give them some more uh, exposure to core linguistic skills such as vocabulary and grammar, which are of course essential for accessing the curriculum. Um, the benefits, uh, broadly speaking, were for the child, therefore to improve rich exposure to English over and above everything they're getting in school in a one-to-one -one fun and motivating context with uh, a young student from the university who were very enthusiastic about this. Uh, this then uh, should have led to improved English, which will help the children access the curriculum and therefore improved educational outcome. But also, we were trying to build on their confidence in communicating. There was a lot of time spent at the beginning sort of getting to know the children and you know, at the end of the, of the program, we saw this really developing uh, a lot. And of course, um, improved integration into the school and the wider community. There was, of course, a lot of benefits from this also for our students. Uh, so, uh, you know, there was a, a great opportunity here for our students to apply all this core linguistics uh, knowledge that they're getting into university into a real case situations and therefore also to make a, a meaningful impact on society. Of course, they had to choose to be volunteers for Bernardo's uh, to participate in this program. And that, of course, would have, we thought, improved their <coughs> employability skills. For the school, uh, you know, in the future, particularly if we'll manage to extend this uh, further, we thought this would bring some increased support uh, because it's over and above what they're already doing. And also, importantly, and there will be quite a bit of discussions about this later, um, we were providing advice on something that perhaps, uh, you know, linguistic expertise is really necessary for the, in the recognition of the specific areas of transfer, which is a sort of a, a technical term that is used in linguistic, in linguistic to describe when the first language has an impact on the second language. So the mistakes you, you find in the second language are not random. They're typically related to what the first language grammar looks like and therefore improve the educational outcomes. Now, why do we need a program like this? Uh, well, you know, uh, as it's uh, as we all know, the demographic of the UK and Europe is changing massively, and uh, multilingualism, bilingualism, trilingualism is uh, much more a fact and an important aspect of our society. And you know, there are an increased number of children that are uh, coming from all sorts of backgrounds coming into um, schools, and when. Uh, children are learning two languages not from birth. So when we have children that we call sequential bilinguals, which is when you're, you're starting from birth with a language and then a second language is introduced later, um, there aren't just benefits of, of uh, having more than one language. Benefits are still there, but there are challenges. And it, you know, it, it would be uh, impossible not to recognize that. And so um, you know, intervention is needed. And of course, there is research that indicates that, in fact, newcomer pupils are at risk of underachievement, if not sufficiently supported. This is, of course, recognized um, by Danny, who has, uh, in fact, introduced a special fund to support this kind of children. So our initiative, therefore, aimed to capitalize on the advantages of bilingualism, whilst also helping to reduce the potential challenges that are faced by this kind of children by sort of providing them with further uh, English support um, whilst continuing to promote the importance of the other language and also support that it's specifically linguistically informed, okay? 
So the figures that then uh, are sort of at the background of this uh, um, uh, uh, policy regarding newcomer pupils are that are here in the next few slides. So English is not the first language, as was said in the last census in 2011, for 3.1% of the population. And in fact, 2.13% of the populations are uh, composed of uh, homes where there is no person for, for whom English is the first language. And newcomer pupils are children, um, basically, that are recognized when they come into the school system as uh, having additional requirements or additional needs when it comes to the learning of English. And uh, Danny, again, in, in its uh, report, uh, says that in the school census in 2013, more than 10,000 newcomer pupils were uh, present in Northern Ireland and a large part of them in the Belfast Educational Library Board area. Uh, many of these people attend primary school, but there also are some in, in the other schools. And um, basically, the diversity of these people's backgrounds and needs is much wider than we have ever uh, encountered before. And of course, as we've said before, uh, new paper, new, newcomer pupils may not have the necessary skill in certain cases uh, in the language of, of instruction to access the curriculum. So it's a really important uh, issue to try to address. And in fact, Danny allocates funds to school each year uh, for the newcomer pupil. And, uh, um, this is the figure that we found on the um, uh, report that says that in 2008-9, over six million um, pounds were dedicated to this. And these uh, funds are meant to build upon and maintain the expertise of their teaching staff and provide specific support to, this, uh, to those newcomer pupils who have been identified in the census by school as needing support. So, um, why do we think we need this kind of initiative? Well, our innovative language made fun, which as I said before, was a pilot, was run with few students, aimed to provide, uh, you know, potentially uh, support for children, for teachers working with newcomer pupils by providing expert advice on transfers from specific uh, foreign languages and the development of resources tailored to multilingual children, which would be a spin-off, of course, of this kind of project. And we think that this project represents a cost-effective option for the use of these funds, because what we'll show you later is that on the one end, one might think, okay, you need a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship with this child to um, provide this kind of, um, uh, of support. But what we discovered was that the, analy the deep analysis of a, of a relatively small amount of language actually revealed a lot about the areas of transfers between uh, the two languages. And now I'm going to leave Patrick to say more about the details. So, thank you, Rafi. What I'm going to do now is talk through the details of the pilot study in, uh, in each of the phases. As Rafi said, it was a five-phase project, and it began with a phase of recruitment and training. We had to recruit children, or Bernardo's recruited the children for the project, and we focused on recruiting the um, students who would be involved. And the request that we made, as Rafi said, was that we begin for the pilot to have a homogeneous group. So, we, so they selected for us a, a small group of children who were all same age, same stage, same amount of exposure, same native language. Um, we then recruited a matching number of students and what we did was we asked them to apply with a CV, a statement of interest, but we primarily also focused on their academic qualifications. So we took our best students to be involved in this pilot project. Those students were then interviewed by Bernardo's to, to be sure that they, were, they made good volunteers for Bernardo's and then they had to go through Access MI clearance. Um, the students were then put through a training process because obviously they were going to be the ones who were delivering the program supported by us. So they went through standard volunteer training with Bernardo's. They went through specialist English as additional language training with, a with an English as additional language teacher. And then they went through specialized training with a speech therapist who could show them how to use formal assessment uh, processes and techniques. Um, and as I've said, throughout the project they had support from the linguistic staff at uh, Ulster. The first stage of the delivery of the project proper involved observation and assessment of the children. So we began initially with an informal assessment period. This is where the students were meeting the children every week. They were recording, they were playing with them, getting language samples from them essentially so that we had recordings of naturally occurring language with, this, with the children. Um, they kept logs of their sessions and they were also crucially at this stage building up a relationship with the children so the children trusted them when they moved into uh, more formal assessment procedures which is what we did next we used an assessment a standardized assessment that is used clinically uh, it's a very broad assessment process that allowed us to look both at their use of language and their comprehension of language to look at their vocabulary their grammar their morphology 
Um, what we found from the um, formal assessment was that, according to these standardised tests, the children across all three children showed a delay in vocabulary, in their expressive vocabulary particularly. When it came to grammar and morphology, two of them were right on the edge of the normal range, but right, on the, right at the lower edge, and one was outside showing some kind of delay. So it was clear that there were both vocabulary and more kind of structural issues with the children's language. And um, we compared those formal assessment results with the observations based using the linguistics staff from Ulster looking at the transcripts. And that was really important because what we discovered was that the formal assessment processes didn't have the sensitivity to show us everything that we needed to know about these children. Analyzing the transcripts using our linguistic expertise and our familiarity with the structural properties of their mother tongue was an important additional component in evaluating the language needs of the pupils. Um, a third part of our assessment process was to interview teachers, and this was particularly interesting. The teachers had to fill in a newcomer pu the, new the standard newcomer pupil questionnaire, but we also interviewed the teachers. And what transpired from those interviews very clearly was that the teachers, th simply through classroom practices, didn't have access to the level of detail to be able to really evaluate the language skills of these pupils. So our, our informal observational practices, the, the transcripts that we used and the formal assessment using the self were much more revealing than anything that the teachers could explicitly arrive at. Based on those assessments then, we, uh, we draw con drew conclusions about what we should target on in the intervention. And we obviously, this was a short intervention program, we were not attempting to fix everything in their language use. So what we were doing was we were trying to identify what we would prioritise in their language use. So we focused on two aspects. We focused on vocabulary. Um, we focused on core tier one vocabulary and tier two vocabulary, which is the, the, an expansion of the basic set of vocabulary that you'd expect children at this age to have. And that was about improving their functional communication. But we also focused on three core areas of grammar that we identified. Um, and we particularly focused on these because they were consistent across the three children, but they were also recognizably uh, items that were potential transfer from their mother tongue. Um, so the things that we focused on in their grammar, uh, we've given to you here. So it was clear there was an issue with subject-verb agreement for these students, for these pupils. Um, also at the level of verbs in their language use, they were missing auxiliaries, missing copulas in constructions like the girl is running, they were producing forms like the girl run. Um, and lastly, with pronouns, they were clearly having huge difficulty with pronouns. So they were producing um, incorrect pronoun forms. Um, so him is tired rather than he is tired. The ball is him's rather than the ball is his. So as I said, these, these particular things we targeted on on the basis of consistency, the, the transfer from Arabic, but also what we recognised were these were features that could be relatively straightforwardly targeted in the time frame of the intervention that we had. Um, and that was really important. So then we moved into the intervention stage of the project, and uh, there we had six sessions, each lasting an hour. And six sessions might not seem very long, but um, it's important to recognise in the clinical world, for example, the six sessions would be the standard duration of a clinical intervention too. And it's not, this is not to suggest that these children have clinical profiles, but more to suggest that six sessions is actually long enough to have an impact if you're doing language interventions. So uh, the students received training in how to devise their intervention sessions. They tailored them specifically to their children and produced reflective logs. And it's particularly important to notice that at this stage, the relationship building in the early observational stage of the project was important because the students each knew their pupil. They could target the kinds of activities that they knew the child would enjoy because we really wanted this not to feel like school for the pupils. We were working on grammar and vocabulary, but we wanted them to feel that they were playing and having fun. And you can see some of the activities they did with them. Um, and here's just an illustration of the kinds of resources they might have used. Moving into the evaluation of the project, um, what became very clear looking at the transcripts of the post-intervention sessions is that the children were producing longer, more complex sentences, which meant that they were able to communicate more complex ideas, which clearly means they're more able to engage in the curriculum in school. Particularly striking was the increase in their confidence that was also leading to them communicating more, and I think that's really significant, a significant effect of the project. Um, Relating specifically to the language errors that we observed, um, it was clear that there was a notable reduction in the frequency of the error types. 
Um, there was also a notable, noticeable reduction in the areas that we hadn't focused on in the intervention. So there was a generalised, <coughs> excuse me, language benefit uh, to the intervention. Um, I won't go through these because there isn't time, but it's just to illustrate, and you have them on the slides, the kinds of improvements in the language forms that they were using. So we can see the issues of subject-verb agreement, missing copulas, question formation tense. These are all significantly improved in the language output at the end. Okay? Looking at the formal assessment process, and of course that's important because there is a, it's standardised. There are norm, there are standardised against norms, so we can see that how they're working against their age group. What we saw was minor improvements for two out of the three children in expressive vocabulary and syntax. But it's important to remember that that didn't that formal assessment tool didn't give us the most comprehensive picture of the children's language abilities. So it was never going to give us the most thorough picture of their improvements either. Uh, teacher interviews are still being carried out at this stage, so we'll, we can follow up on those. Parents, we talked to the parents after the project, and what they pointed out was how much the children had enjoyed it and how much more confident they felt their children were and that they felt their children's language skills had really improved. The students who were involved in the project, they felt that it was extremely well organised, that they were very well supported, that, that, everything, that they learned a lot through the process and that everybody benefited from it. Um, what have we learned from the project overall? Well, crucially, we've learned, among other things, that standardised language assessments are really useful, but they are not fully appropriate for these bilingual children and don't give a full picture of what's going on. Um, what we saw, crucially, was that a relatively small amount, as Rafi said, of recorded and transcribed language samples of single language groups gave us much more access to a, a more holistic picture of the children's language abilities. And that, that essentially requires linguistic expertise to analyse the transcripts. Um, so the other crucial learning from the project is that it's perhaps an unreasonable expectation to think that teachers in the normal run of the day in school are going to be able to access the linguistic profiles of these children. Our future plans are to expand the project. We would like, we are currently with Bernardo seeking funding to, to run the project with larger numbers of pupils so that we can have pupils from, say, the top five um, um, uh, newcomer languages in Northern Ireland, that will allow us to compile data about the kinds of transfer areas you see for the main groups of newcomer pupils that teachers and schools are experiencing, and that will allow us to help develop resources for teachers in the future. So, thank you.